Okay, we're going to continue now with the uh, presentation on the fall of man. In our next segment here, we're going to go a little bit more deeply into the process of the fall, especially in the initial part of the fall, which we call the spiritual fall. And this is the um, um, uh, struggle of dominion between Lucifer and initially Eve. So we have uh, gone through the first step of uh, Lucifer failing to take God's viewpoint then uh, Lucifer uh, leaves his proper position, the position where he would receive God's love. Lucifer then uh, begins to feel a lack of love and uh, seeks a replacement for God's love, which brings him to uh, contend the commandment not to eat the fruit. Instead, Lucifer uh, calls Eve's attention to the fruit, that it's pleasing and a wonderful thing and uh, that we should go ahead and eat it and uh, we see that Lucifer reverses dominion by giving that word Eve uh, solidifies that reversal by responding to it and partaking in the fruit so uh, where we left off in our last segment was right here that we then were able to conclude the actual meaning of the fruit. We know it's not a literal fruit, so what, what does the fruit symbolize? And we look at Proverbs 30, 20, and Song of Songs 4, 12 to 16. Proverbs 30, 20 talks about eating, using the metaphor of eating a fruit, representing sexual immorality, the way of an adulteress. And Song of Songs, uh, indicates uh, uh, or, or uses the, uh, the symbol of fruit to also represent the experience of sexual love. Uh, this is uh, actually in Song of Songs. This is King David speaking to his bride. He says, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits. Well, his bride wasn't the uh, manager at the produce section down at the Safeway. Her her response to him is, let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. Well, she's talking about the experience of love on the sexual level. I just want to remind everybody, this is in the Bible, so you can, uh, you can check it. So um, the point being that the fruit is not a literal fruit. It's, it's specifically representing love, the experience of love. And uh, certainly uh, it's not a coincidence that in the popular culture, uh, whenever you say uh, or, or refer to the forbidden fruit, it, it generally uh, does have a sexual connotation. Um, the significance in terms of what we're talking about is um, that Lucifer has had a an interaction with Eve, which we call the spiritual fall, that implies that there was some type of uh, contact on the sexual level between an angel who is a spiritual being and a human being who is a physical being. And how is it possible that uh, that kind of angelic interaction could take place with humans? And one thing that we uh, really should uh, remember is that human beings are not just physical, but human beings are also spiritual. So there is a point of contact which we can see displayed throughout the scripture. An example of Jacob wrestling an angel in Genesis 32, 22 to 32. Jacob wrestles an angel. That's some pretty intense interaction with a spiritual being. Or in Genesis 19:3, where Lot prepares a meal for the angels and they eat. Now, don't ask me to explain it, you know, but just the reality is that sometimes we think of spiritual and physical as so extreme that uh, never the twain shall meet. But in fact, there is a common base between spirituality between the spirit and the material. Obviously, uh, probably the most dramatic example of that is is the uh, human being, where there's a high degree of spiritual and physical interaction, which we call the mind and body relationship. And, of course, one of the key 
elements of the principle with regard to give and take action between subject and object is that there must be something in common. And, uh, you know, that could be a whole uh, lecture, actually. What is the common base between the spirit and the physical, between the spirit and the body? There is something in common. So there's a point of interaction between the two. And the uh, point here being that we have to understand that Lucifer and Eve's relationship was highly dy dynamic, was not like Lucifer is just the spiritual uh uh, ethereal presence, otherworldly, and she heard a voice in her head. Uh, not at all. It, a very dynamic relationship. And I think Hebrews 13.1 indicates the potential uh, of uh, the dynamism of the relationship between a earthly person and the spiritual angel in Hebrews 13.1. It says that we should... Uh, let brotherly love continue, and be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. And that really testifies that angels can be in our midst, and we would not necessarily uh, recognize that that's an angel. So um, it, it also speaks to the um, the mythological uh, uh typical uh, artistic rendering of angels with huge wings and very noticeable. Certainly anybody with wings uh, would be uh, pretty high profile and noticeable. But when we really examine what the scripture says, it, uh, we can recognize and see in the biblical record that when angels would appear, they initially would be uh, misidentified as just another person in the crowd. So, um, Hebrews 13.1 is telling us that, hey, uh, angels can uh, certainly be in your midst and you wouldn't necessarily uh, notice a difference. Well, this is explaining then the, um, or shows the potential that when we are referring to Eve and Lucifer having a love relationship, we have to understand that they, that Lucifer was a dynamic presence in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we can see other supporting evidence uh, when we're talking about the uh, the archetype of the fall in the uh, Genesis story, uh, that the the archetype really does involve a uh, sexual be betrayal. It's quite apparent when we really uh, take a look, for example, at the sin of the angels. If you recall, there's uh, Lucifer, the archangel, and if uh, you, if we uh, go back to, uh, if we think about Revelation 12, uh, verse 7, where it talks about Michael and his angels, and Satan and his angels, which is the foundation by which we conclude that Lucifer is an archangel, um, the behavior of his Angels, which uh, is uh, testified to in in Second Peter two five or two four, that the there were angels that left their position and were judged, uh, and those angels are the his angels of Revelation twelve and seven. So his angels are doing as their leader Lucifer did, and we see a, a, a further testimony in Jude chapter 1, verse 6, and the angels, these are his angels, Lucifer's angels, who did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for the judgment on the great day. These, again, are the same angels that are being testified to here in Second Peter. So what is it that these angels, his angels, did it, goes on in the 7th and 8th verse, in a similar way, meaning in a similar way, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns, they, the angels, his angels, gave up themselves to sexual immorality and perversion. And they serve as an example those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, which is a euphemism for 
uh, sexual immorality. Another very interesting uh, testimony in Genesis 6-2 talks about the sons of God or the Bene Elohim, which is Hebrew for angels. And uh, many times the English translation uses the term sons of God, but the term actually is referring to angels. And Genesis 6-2 testifies to the Bene Elohim saw the daughters of men and married any of them that they chose. Now, again, these are the angels, uh, his angels, Lucifer's angels. And where did they learn how to do that? They are just reciprocating what, in fact, Lucifer instigated with Eve. Uh, and that what Lucifer instigated with Eve was an immoral sexual relationship. And the betrayal the disobedience of the commandment, which we now know God is saying when he says, don't eat the fruit, he's telling them, don't engage in a sexual relation. God is setting up a premarital period of abstinence and where Adam and Eve must exert a dominion over their body. Uh, and certainly the sexual desire is the strongest of the body's desire. So God is setting up a premarital abstinence period in the Garden of Eden. This is the original archetype. And um, and Lucifer is violating this in, a, in, in two ways. One in that certainly Lucifer in no way as an angel was meant to be uh, Eve's partner uh, on the sexual level. Uh, Lucifer was meant to be uh, like a, a servant of Adam and Eve, but so it was a total violation, a total distortion of the original archetype in that regard. And, and secondly, in that it violated, on the, from the perspective of Eve, it was a betrayal of what her role was to be. And we're going to see that Adam reciprocates in that betrayal. So uh, because uh, the betrayal uh, between uh, Adam and Eve and, and between God involved the sexual, uh, uh, it was a sexual beha uh, betrayal. We see this archetype reflected throughout the scripture, all the way up even into the end of the New Testament in Paul's letters in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? And uh, he goes on to say, flee from sexual in." immorality. Look at this. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So Paul, even up to the age of Paul, uh, the idea of sexual sin was uh, unique and uh, the, the, the most devastating sin because it was a sin against her own body. Uh, and what does that mean? There's many uh, dimensions of the body. First of all, for Adam and Eve, keeping faith in the commandment, not to engage in a sexual relation before they were perfected, is really the key to them rising out of the realm of natural law and into the divine realm with God. So uh, when Adam and Eve violated that commandment, they sinned against their own potentiality to stand as divine sons and daughters of God and to become true parents, which means they sin against the body of their family, meaning they give birth to children that are born in sin. That's a second body that is sinned against the family. And it expands. We see Cain and Abel kill, you know, Cain kills Abel. Violence emerges and expands to the next body, the community, the nation, the world. So ultimately, uh, sinning against the body has many dimensions, and, and it's the sexual betrayal that does that in the Garden of Eden. And uh, we see that then the process of the fall continues. Uh, after Eve's illicit relationship with Lucifer, uh, the illicit relationship of love, she reciprocates with the same word. She tempts Adam with the fruit. And the same dynamic takes place. Adam says, we're not supposed to eat this. She says, go ahead, it's all right, and it's wonderful. And she tempts Adam. 
in what we term the physical fall. The physical fall, uh, of course, Adam and Eve were intended to be husband and wife, and they were intended to have a sexual relation, uh, which would have been div- in the realm of the divine and would have produced a divine fruit, God's very own lineage. But in this context, you see, this is where sexuality uh, becomes alienated from God. It's not because sexuality inherently is ungodly. God created it. But in this original manifestation of it, this original standard, it, sexuality became the tool of betrayal and separation from God. And so uh, Eve reverses dominion over Adam in the same way, and Adam partakes in the fruit. And thus, sin multiplies from the archangel to Eve to Adam. Sin multiplies. And, of course, we can see the evidence of what the physical fall was between Eve and Adam. In Genesis 2.25, before the fall, they were naked and unashamed. After the fall, they cover their nakedness. They become cognizant of the sexual areas of their body, and they are ashamed. And this shame of sexuality has continued through the ages. You know, there is a deep archetype of shame of sexuality, and this is why we cover the sexual areas of our body. People are uncomfortable to talk about sexuality. It's probably one of the most difficult topics for parents to talk about with their children and so forth. And we see the... uh, the devastation in our society of uh, the the perversion of the sexual relationship and and how uh, the sexual relation becomes such a base and low um, uh, experience in society and thus we also see uh, the historical reality uh, of of uh, this archetype is that whenever a culture can uh, embrace the ideal of abstinence before marriage and fidelity within marriage, that culture will rise and uh, create a vigorous, enduring culture. Whenever a culture uh, loses the concept or never embraces the concept of a premarital abstinence or a fidelity within marriage, that culture vacillates and disappears. So this archetype exists, and really uh, you can chart the rise and and fall of cultures based on um, those parameters, those original parameters. We're going to conclude with the results of the fall. There are many results of the fall that we could take a look at, but we want to look at the most significant one. And, And it is the rise of a counter- contrary sovereignty over the lineage of man. Uh, Through the condition of the spiritual and physical fall, the archangel reverses dominion and takes the position of God, ruler, and father over the first human ancestors, Adam and Eve, and over, by extension, their lineage. And uh, if you recall in our first presentation uh, in our introduction, we talked about this contradiction within the individual. And now we can see that the, this, the origin of this contradiction is that at the very root of our ancestry, um, the ownership, the sovereignty uh, of two gods was falsely established. God, the true God, still has uh, a claim over us, but through the condition of the original sin, Satan, likewise, has a claim. And so God lost exclusive sovereignty over his lineage. Satan seized a godlike role. That, and how did he get that role? It's really through the cooperation of Adam and Eve. When they acquiesced to his word uh, and at the same time rejecting the word of God. So Lucifer takes God's position by being the giver of the word. Adam and Eve solidify that position by receiving that word and acting upon it. And thus, Adam and Eve uh, stand in a position to be also um, 
uh, under the sovereignty of a false god. And thus, their children are born in sin. This is the concept of the original sin. I often wonder, what could a baby be doing in the, win- in the womb that, that uh, resulted in their birth in sin? But now we can understand that it wasn't the baby, but it's the legacy that was established by the first human ancestors. And it's also why God grieved that he had made man on earth in Genesis 6.6. His heart was not filled with joy, but with pain and sorrow, because God lost his lineage, and instead a lineage was fostered that stands in contradiction to God's original purpose. This sinning, a sin against the body, this betrayal uh, in the use of sexuality in the original archetype, uh, this sin against the body extends to the body of the individual, to the family body, to the nation body, to the world body, to the historical body. And thus we see conflict, sorrow, suffering, and pain. And we see it even to this day. If we pick up our newspaper or turns on our TV, we see the results of the fall. Uh, Mankind lost the true parents in the beginning. Adam and Eve were to aspire to that position, but they fell away and could not accomplish it. And thus, the goal of history has been to restore the position of a true Adam and a true Eve that could stand as the true parents of all mankind. This is our presentation of the fall, and um, thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you got a lot from this presentation, and that you'll continue your study in the Divine Principle. Have a great day. I'm Kevin McCarthy. I enjoyed our time together.